She was the third of three, the baby. But Molly Young had a soul much older than her years. Tell me about Molly. She loved music and art and literature, very into intellectual and articulate. A staunch nonconformist with the heart of an artist and the talent to back it up. Well, Molly is my youngest daughter, my baby daughter. She liked uh, photography and art, and she was very good at it. In high school, she even placed in a national photo competition. But behind the camera, Molly's life wasn't always so picture perfect. As a teen, she struggled with bouts of depression, often writing about them in her journal. And then later, there was the scare. She had what she thought was cancer out of the thyroid. Some of her photographs, you can see the knot on her neck. And she got scared and depressed. Surgery removed the mass, and thankfully, it wasn't cancer. But some say that around that time, there was a dangerous malignancy growing in Molly's midst. Her boyfriend, a young Carbondale police dispatcher named Richie Minton. You know, they're early 20s. Most of the guys at her age are not the most responsible. So I thought, oh my gosh, he's got a good job. So when they first got together, I was actually happy for her. I was thrilled that she was with him. But Molly's dad had a much different first impression something about that smile. Explain to me this smile. When he smiled, it, it just, and I don't know if it's because of his bad teeth, but just a feeling, you know, a feeling that he, he's an evil person. And that was the first time you met him? Yeah. Larry admits it could have been the overprotective father in him, but according to others, there were plenty of tangible reasons to disapprove of the relationship. What is it that you didn't like about him? I knew he was manipulative from the things she had told me. I knew he put her down. And apparently, Molly ended things several times, but Molly's mom says Richie knew just how to get her daughter back. I was over at her house one day. She said, Richie just texted me that he's gonna kill himself if we don't get back together. I said, he is manipulating you. I said, he's not going to kill himself. She said, well, how can you be sure though, mom? And it went back and forth like this for over a year until one day, staying away became much more complicated. She called me one morning and she was with him. She told me then, I'm pregnant. We've talked about it and I've decided I'm gonna have an abortion. With Richie in the room, Molly tells her sister that given her recent medical issues, she doesn't feel healthy enough to carry the baby. But Holly says, that wasn't the full story. She later told me that the real reason was because she did not want him to treat their child the way that he had always treated her. She described him as sociopathic. She described his narcissism and sense of grandeur and just um, not really having empathy for others. She didn't feel like he was capable of raising a child. It's a serious claim, and no one but Molly's family can verify the conversation even took place. But what does seem well documented is that Richie did take Molly to have a medically induced abortion. And shortly after that, the two broke up again. Then a few days later, Friday, March 23rd, it's just after 10 p.m. when Molly's mom, Kathy, pokes her head in to say goodnight, a moment now frozen in time. She was in bed with her pajamas on, and so I went to bed. Early the next morning, an eerie feeling wakes Kathy out of a deep sleep. About 5.30, I went to peek in her room, and she wasn't in there, so... I texted her, and she never texted me back. After several more texts, Kathy drives around town looking for her daughter, even circling what she thinks is Richie's apartment complex. I didn't find his apartment, so I turned around, and then I headed home. It wasn't long after that, 9.02 a.m. to be exact, when Jackson County Police dispatchers received this call. 911, what's your emergency? 
I, I, we have a person in my living facility who we believe to be dead. The call is from a young man named Wes Romack, Richie's roommate, and the person he believes to be dead. Richie can take it from here. Oh, here. Hello? Hello? Hey, I'm at Okay, and who is this to you? Uh, it's my ex-girlfriend. Okay, and is she not breathing at all? No, she, I woke up and she's covered in blood. She's overdosed, she bled out through the nose. Richie will later tell police he saw a pill bottle next to Molly's body and that it was the reason he said the following after getting transferred to his own dispatch center in Carbondale. Hey, I'm going to send a name here, but they have a 1079. Amber? Yeah. This is Richie. My girlfriend just committed to it. Nine hours. Can you send a name here? Can you send a car over? Yep, we'll be on our way. Thanks, Amber. Molly Young, just 21 years old, had taken her own life, suicide by drug overdose, at least according to Richie Minton. All right, can I go ahead and hang up? Yeah. But just how accurate was that story? As it turns out, just seven minutes after the call, another comes into a private line to dispute Richie Minton's account. The person calling, Richie Minton. Driving up, please. Hey, Amber. Yeah. Hey, um, you sent the sergeant. She didn't OD. I just saw my gun laying underneath her. <clears throat> she didn't OD. I just saw my gun laying underneath her. <clears throat> okay, is it Molly? Yeah. Former Carbondale, Illinois police chief Jody O'Gwin explains the discrepancy. The initial call came in as the overdose. Uh, apparently then as Richie went over to tend to her to see if there was anything that he could do, when he moved her, uh, he noticed uh, that his handgun uh, was laying next to her uh, and that she had a head wound that was consistent with uh, a gunshot. Carbondale police arrive at Richie Minton's apartment just minutes after that second call. But apparently the investigation, or at least an investigation, began much earlier that morning when Richie didn't show up for his 7 a.m. shift as a Carbondale 911 operator. He was several hours behind schedule. It's actually how this whole process started. One of the other uh, telecommunicators in the command center he began texting him uh, to find out where he was at, and that's what caused him to wake up, apparently, uh, and then find the scene in his in his bedroom. That's Richie's story, anyway. Sorry, that I'm late. Hey, no, don't worry about it, Richie. It's, it's not a problem. All right, thank you. All right. Is there an immediate conflict of interest because he works for the Carbondale Police Department? I would think there would be, and that's why I immediately told my deputy chief uh, to secure the scene, not let anyone else in or out, uh, and to call the state police to take over the investigation. But before Illinois State Police arrive, Richie and his roommate, Wes Romack, are taken to the station for questioning. What did he say in essence? That was basically the, he had went out for a night uh, prior to, he had been drinking, he had vomited on his clothing, he had called Molly to come and help him get out of his uh, clothing. The time, phone records would later show, was a little after 3 a.m. Richie goes on to tell police that Molly was abused as a child and had tried to kill herself before. As for when Molly actually shot herself, Richie can't say. After she came over, he passed out drunk and must have slept through it. Those were spontaneous statements that were made at the police station you know, while we were waiting for the state police investigators to respond to uh, conduct a formal interview. And as it turns out, they're pretty much the only statements authorities will get from Richie. After those comments, he stopped talking. And by the time state police arrive, just after 10 a.m., Richie already has parents and a lawyer present. And that's not all. He had two six-inch scratches on his side that were fresh. The scratches on Minton's back, where'd they come from? I don't know. Uh, Richie's statement is that uh, he must have gotten those scratches while giving uh, Molly CPR. Scratches from a dead girl's hands? I honestly don't think he knows where they came from uh, because in my opinion that was a ridiculous statement. 
State investigators seem to think things weren't adding up either. In an email sent at 10.16 a.m., barely an hour after that 911 call, one sergeant writes, the death of the victim was initially believed to be a suicide. However, when questioned, the dispatcher suspiciously lawyered up. The incident is being investigated as a homicide. Was Richie Minton a suspect? Initially, I would say that he was a suspect, yes. But then, that was just the beginning. At that point, Molly's family didn't even know she was gone yet. And when did you get the call? When I drove up in the afternoon, there was a state police car in the driveway. He said, I regret to inform you that your daughter's been killed. And I fell to the floor. After that, it was Kathy's job to tell the rest of the family that nothing would ever be the same again. I never knew I was going to run out of time with her. I'm sorry. As for Molly's father, Larry. I got called by uh, Molly's mother. I went to the police station and, the, and asked to speak to the first responding officer. I said, I want to know the who, what, when, where, and why. That's when Larry says a state lieutenant walked him outside and gave him the first hint that this would be no open and shut case. The first thing he told me, this lieutenant said, father to father, Carbondale police botched the case. They let him wash his hands and change clothes at the scene. You heard right. According to Carbondale's own police records, responding officers let Richie go to the bathroom to clean up before even taking him to the station. And there was more. While police still hadn't executed a search warrant on Richie's home, back at Molly's mom's house... We had two state troopers come into the house with my 80-year-old mother and handed her a search warrant to go in Molly's bedroom, get the computer, got her camera. Though it wasn't yet clear what police were looking for, it would be soon. The very next day, after receiving the initial police reports, the coroner summarizes his findings as such. The investigation conducted by the agencies involved indicated self-inflicted wound. The manner of death is classifiable as suicide. When asked what he thinks about that conclusion, Molly's father had this to say. I don't believe that for a second. Just one day after police started investigating Molly Young's death as a homicide, a coroner changed it to suicide. Her family says cops had it right the first time. She was everything to me. I would have never left that room if in my mind I thought she was depressed or suicidal. So what changed for investigators? Apparently, after seizing Molly's computer, they found multiple searches of the word suicide from the day before she died. Police also found Molly's journals with several references to her unhappiness with life. And on top of all of that, there was a handwritten note found on the floor of her bedroom, which police say spelled everything out. What about the suicide note that they found in her bedroom. It didn't mention the word suicide. What it was did a goodbye it? letter. It was written a year prior, right after she had the cancer scare. And well, I, I believe she thought she was gonna die of cancer. But then it wasn't just what police collected in Molly's bedroom. Sir, she had two like, scratches in the middle of her back. Where those things from? I, I have a fairly physical job. Though Richie Minton refused to give a statement to police, his roommate, Wesley Romack, agreed to go on the record. It's been open knowledge that she's had very suicidal thoughts for quite some time. Romack, who says he was friends with both Richie and Molly, was at work at his night job when everything happened. I worked until about 5.30. And that would have been this morning, correct? My cell phone had died, so I plugged my cell phone out. Okay. Um, I checked my messages. I'd had a few from Molly. Messages investigators believe were sent just before she died. She sends you a text um, about 4.40 in the morning. You're still at work, I guess, right? Right. Do you remember what that text said? The last text that she sent me, all I, all I remember was 
It said he had been texting another girl asking her to stay the night. Okay. And that he was so drunk that he couldn't walk, and she also apologized uh, if I came home to anything dramatic. Actually, what the text said was, quote, I think I'm going to shoot myself in the head. I'm really, really sorry if you come home to that. And so at about 7 or 7.30, you go to sleep. What's the next thing that happens after that? I wake up to Richie opening my door and saying, Molly's dead, help, I can't find my phone. Wes's comments, that text, they sure seem to support the same conclusion Richie reported in the beginning. But Molly's loved ones vehemently disagree. And her dad says he can refute every piece of so-called evidence authorities have. So how do you explain that suicidal text that night that she died? He did it. He did what? Typed her phone in. A text is not handwriting or fingerprints. Anybody, my wife types half of my text. He had control of her phone that morning. So you're saying she didn't send that text? No. And he's not the only one saying it. As part of the young family's search for answers, Molly's father has assembled a committee of civilian investigators, including veteran police officer Charles Lamont. I was a policeman for the city of Mount Vernon for over 33 years. I retired as a captain. But he admits more than any other case he's ever worked, this one is personal. Molly is your niece. Correct. At what point did you switch roles from grieving uncle to backseat investigator? It was when I saw that the investigation was bent, if you will, toward an investigation of Molly, and very little, if anything, had been done as far as Richie Minton goes. In fact, while police seized Molly's computer the day she was found dead, officers didn't collect Richie's until roughly two months later. And when it comes to what police found on Molly's computer... Do you find it at all suspicious that investigators say when they checked Molly's computer, there were very recent searches on how to kill yourself? No, it doesn't concern me at all. He says that's because an interview with one of Molly's friends revealed she was with him at a local club the night those searches were made. When they were at the concert is the approximate time those searches appeared on her computer, but she didn't have her laptop with her. Well, who would have done that then? Wasn't, that, wasn't the laptop at the grandmother's house? That's where it was picked up at, but I don't know where it was two days prior or a day and a half prior. Are you suggesting premeditation here? No, I'm just simply stating she was at a concert when those searches were made on her computer. And then there was the physical evidence. She was shot in the top of the head with his gun, execution stall. And on the left side of her head, using what looked like her left hand, but Molly was right-handed. And that's not all. There was no gunshot residue on her hands, and her fingerprints weren't on the gun. Now, to be fair, Richie's hands also tested negative for gunshot residue. But remember, he got to wash up first. So a lot has been made about the fact that Richie Minton was permitted to change clothes and wash his hands. Yes. And don't you find that inappropriate? I do not. The evidence that they would have obtained from even his filthy hands was not enough to prove whether or not he did the crime or not. Uh, so that the hand washing thing is really inconsequential. But what about basic crime scene protocol? Why didn't anybody bag his hands? I don't know uh, why that didn't occur. No one told me that they allowed him to wash his hands. I mean, was there disciplinary action taken? Because that's that's a pretty big botch up. No, there was no disciplinary action taken because no one would admit to me that they allowed him to wash his hands. I cannot imagine that you, with the with the law enforcement background that you have so stellar, that, that it in any way would be okay for Richie Minton's hands not to have been preserved and bagged. Did I say that it was okay, Anna? That I, I didn't say that. It was a tense exchange, but the questions were only about to get harder because months after Molly Young's death was classified as suicide, everything was set to change once again. I have been alone a long time. 
Richie, all I ever wanted was to be with you, and I'm sorry that I made that so hard. Mom and Dad, I love you. It's not your fault. These are just a few of the words found in what investigators are calling Molly Young's suicide note. But Molly's family says police have it all wrong. It was found in her bedroom. It wasn't found at the scene. And he says the note never specifically mentions suicide and was actually written up to a year before her death. One of her best friends, he read that note like three or four months before she, Molly showed him that note. And that's just one of the many reasons they believe Molly's death was not a suicide. Another? Richie said that he slept through the gunshot that would have been within feet of him. If she did shoot herself, he says he slept through it. Is that really possible? It depends on, uh, on the, the individual. Uh, each person is different how they sleep. Uh, when a weapon is fired, it depends on how close it may be uh, to an individual's skin, whether or not that sound is muffled. So there are a lot of variables there. Is it uh, something that I would think I would sleep through? No. Is it something that I think it's possible for someone to be able to sleep through? Yes. Is it likely? Likely, no. And yet, being passed out drunk was Richie's story. But if Molly Young's loved ones don't believe that, what do they think really happened the morning she died? I think Richie Minton called Molly at 3 o'clock in the morning, according to our records. He called Molly over, and I think they got into a confrontation. I don't know what the argument was about, but there was obviously an argument because he had scratches on his side. And in a finding that seems a little too coincidental, lab tests did later reveal Richie Minton's DNA under Molly's fingernails. Though remember, he initially said he thought he got those scratches, trying to give Molly's lifeless body CPR. The lab test showed that that's his DNA was under Molly's fingernails. But there's also two other unknown DNA under Molly's fingernails. His roommate had scratches. I believe his roommate heard the fight and sue. His roommate came in to break it up. It should be noted the roommate claims he wasn't even home at the time. And I believe Richie Minton reached over and touched his side and seen he had blood on his, on the scratches. He, he shot her then. He had many hours before he called 911 to come up with a plan, try to cover his tracks. And Molly's uncle, a former police officer with over 30 years experience, believes how much time Richie had to cover those tracks is reflected in that original 911 call. This is Richie, my girlfriend just committed suicide. What do you make of the 911 call? It was staged, it was rehearsed. Can I, can I go ahead and hang up? Yeah. The tone of it is like a guy ordering a pizza, not like a guy who just lost a girlfriend he once claimed to love. Molly's father agrees. So what does that indicate to you? That indicates that she would, had been dead long before and that uh, he was had time to calm down and it also proves he's a sociopath. How does it prove that? Because who could be calm in that situation? Unless you're a sociopath. <laughs> And while Larry's no doctor, he does point to other disturbing clues to support his diagnosis. One, going back to weeks before Molly died, the very day she and Richie found out she was pregnant. At 8.47, he posted on his Tumblr page, drops a letter poured down upon her head until she's dead. A quote from the notorious Son of Sam serial killer. I don't know what to make of that. I know what to make of it. He's threatening her. And in a surprise move, Larry, along with the rest of Molly's family, would get a chance to make that case. Ten months after Molly's death was ruled a suicide, a special coroner's inquest was convened to take another look. The coroner's jury was to find cause and manner of death only, accidental, criminal, or undetermined. As evidence supporting the original ruling, they provided that supposed suicide note, interviews with investigators, and this. Journals from eight years prior, and uh, last entry was nine months prior. You can't base what happened to my sister that night on a journal that she started when she was 16. I mean, to me, that's ludicrous. 
but they say that's how the inquest went. It was a sham, a total sham. And Charles, who acted as the family's spokesman, says they weren't allowed to present any of their own findings and only got to ask a few questions. So I asked a question about a Son of Sam quote that Richie had deposited in one of his Tumblr accounts. And if I had not asked that question and two or three others, the jury would never have heard that. But did it work? Even with what limited info was presented, the jury came back with a ruling of undetermined. Not enough to call Molly's death a homicide, but more than enough to overturn the original ruling of suicide. And most importantly for Larry and his family, it leaves the door open for justice. Ten months after Molly Young's death was ruled a suicide, a coroner's jury changed it to undetermined. But Molly's father, Larry Young, says there's a ton of evidence they didn't see that would have changed that undetermined to murder. 19 lab tests were done and they all disproved suicide and proved homicide. Were those 19 tests included in the inquest? No. But Larry says he didn't know about them either because even after requesting police records through the Freedom of Information Act, he was denied. And so, after two years of fighting, Larry filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Richie Minton to force release of the files. Our sole purpose was not monetary in the wrongful death suit, it was to get the information because I had no records. They okay. fought me every inch of the way. I didn't even have the 911 tape. Another thing he didn't have, his daughter's cell phone records. And what he found, once he did get them, was huge. Someone deleted text messages off of her phone. There's not one text message on it from Richie Minton until March the 9th. Even though the two dated for over a year. But investigators say that phone went straight into police custody. So who would have had access? Shortly after the coroner's inquest, police re-interview Richie's roommate, Wesley Bromack, and just like that, new information. I got home and went through Richie's phone. Okay. When I arrived home, his, his phone was sitting in the, uh, in the, the common room bathroom. Okay. And I, I, I knew he'd been drinking that night, and I, I looked through the phone to, to see, I guess, kind of where his night ended up. But wait. In his original interview, Wes said they had to use his own phone to call 911 because Richie couldn't find his. I do want to recap, um, because I, honestly, when you just mentioned about going through Richie's phone, you didn't tell us about that before. Really? Yeah. Um... So, the million dollar question. Did you delete anything off his phone while you were looking through it? And Wes Romack has never been charged or even named as a person of interest in Molly's death. But then Larry doesn't think he was responsible for tampering with Richie or Molly's phones anyway. That person, he says, is even closer to home than Richie's roommate. His father is a forensic expert in computers that all the state police go to to analyze the computers for deleted history out of computers. Larry believes that in the four hours between when Molly died and 911 was called, Richie Jr. had plenty of time to have his dad come over and wipe the phones. Richie's father was questioned by police and denied any involvement. In addition, police reports say the parents weren't even notified until after Richie got to the station, but there were rumors of others at the house that morning. Some people in the apartment who were not interviewed, they reported that Carbondale police were on the scene in the neighborhood of 7 a.m. But the 911 call... Wasn't made until after 9 a.m. Now, I don't know how they do it, but if we had had an employee, an officer or a dispatcher that did not show up for work and we could not get hold of them, somebody would have been sent to check on them. If that's the case, they stumbled across the crime scene much earlier than has been reported. If your suspicions are true, that would be a massive cover-up. 
it would be. So I decided to ask former Chief O'Gwyn how it worked in Carbondale. I wouldn't send anybody in this particular incident because uh, we were told that contact was made with him and that he was going to come in, but he was going to be a little late. Hold up. Earlier, O'Gwyn told us Richie didn't even wake up until just before that 911 call, two hours after his 7 a.m. shift. So I'm lost right there. Okay. Because if he's awake to tell your department that he's going to be late, but he hasn't called 911 to report a dead woman in his apartment, what happened there? Yeah, and I, that's a good question. Wow. I mean, of all the things, that's almost the most suspicious. Uh, it's, it's very odd, yes. What do you make of it? I don't know. To be fair, Jody O'Gwyn no longer works for the Carbondale Police Department. Then again, neither does Richie. After two arrests for two separate DUIs, Minton left the department and now works for the St. Louis Fire Department. So we decided to track Richie down to get his side of the story. Richie! Considering what he claims to have slept through, I had to knock Richie? loudly. Richie, are you sleeping? No answer. Our producer did later speak to Minton by phone, who declined to give a statement. And when we asked for his attorney's name, he said he didn't have one, then hung up. As for Larry Young's wrongful death suit, because it took him so long to get police records, by the time he filed, the statute of limitations had run out. So Larry appealed to another authority, State Representative Terry Bryant. I was newly elected, and uh, Larry came to my office, uh, mostly out of frustration because he hadn't been able to get any other legislator to listen to him. After that meeting, the group crafted Molly's Law, which requires agencies to turn over documents requested through the Freedom of Information Act within 30 days or face stiff penalties. Uh, the second component is a component of a statute of limitations, so it makes the statute of limitations five years rather than two. The law passed unanimously. Unfortunately, it won't do anything to help the man who pushed for it. Is it bittersweet for you to have a law named after your daughter and it can't help you? I knew going into that, that, that law that it wouldn't help me. I did it for other people because there's... You can't imagine how many other people are, are going through what I'm going through. For now, the case remains open and has been assigned to a special prosecutor. Though in the last report released, he cites previous Facebook exchanges in which Molly mentions suicide, as well as a lack of proof regarding a cover-up with the gun, Molly's phone, or anything else, as reasons to conclude, although this was a tragic end to a young lady's life, there is simply insufficient evidence at this time to charge anyone as accountable for murder. A full copy of their report can be found on our website, crimewatchdaily.com. So what happens now? It's not a case where you can put a bullet in its head and call it dead. It lives on and it's going to live on until we get as much truth as we can. But there is one truth Molly's family says they don't need police to confirm. If she hadn't have met him, this never would have happened. I believe 100% she would still be here today. At her funeral, I lost it and jumped on her casket and my family had to carry me away. And he didn't even come. Is that what she meant to you, was nothing? And she has one more message for the man she believes took her sister's life. I would tell him that one day my dad is gonna take you down. Just wait.